from inside the warehouse at Oreo Park at Camden Yards, it is the Masson All Access Podcast brought to you by Toyota for legendary safety and reliability. Choose Toyota and let's go places. We are coming to you live. Paul Mancano and Brenda Mortensen here on Facebook and on YouTube to discuss some breaking news as the Baltimore Orioles make a trade to acquire a starting pitcher. Brendan, the Orioles have made perhaps the second trade in Michael Elias's tenure as general manager and executive vice president of the Baltimore Orioles that involved a prospect going out and a major leaguer coming in. The first one that I can think of, and I could be wrong, was when they traded a player to be named later for James McCann a few weeks ago, about a month ago. And today, the Orioles have traded prospect Daryl Hernays to the Oakland A's in exchange for lefty Cole Irvin and Kyle Verbitsky, a 24-year-old righty. Yeah, this is what the Orioles are able to do at this stage in their rebuild. They can now go from an area in their prospect rankings and their farm system where they have a surplus. Daryl Hernays is currently the 15th, 16th ranked prospect in the Orioles' top 30, according to MLB Pipeline. He's probably the Orioles' fifth best shortstop prospect at this point. When you're looking at guys like Gunnar Henderson, Jackson Holiday, Jordan Westberg, and Joey Ortiz, more than likely going to be ranked above him as we get more preseason rankings rolling into 2023. And that's not anything against Hernays. He's still a really solid prospect, but the Orioles are now taking advantage of the number one farm system in all of baseball, not just seeing those dividends pay off for their own club at the big league level, but you're now able to move somebody like Hernays because you have so much depth at shortstop and you're able to acquire a big league pitcher who is, yes, maybe not the high-end pitching talent that we were thinking of going into this offseason, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that as this podcast rolls along, but Cole Irvin's still a really solid addition to this starting rotation, and you didn't really have to give up a huge prospect to get him. I don't think Daryl Hernays was a major piece of the Orioles' future plans at the big league level. At least that's what it seems like from this trade. He could still very well find his way to the big league level in Oakland's organization, or if he has moved to another organization, we'll see. But Hernays was not somebody that the Orioles felt like they needed years down the line. He's not one of their top 10 or so prospects, so they're able to get somebody in return in Cole Irvin, who it seems like will be able to help the big league club right away. So let's talk about this deal. It is a two-for-one. It is official. First reported by Jeff Passan not long ago. The Orioles have made it official. It's two players going to the Baltimore Orioles in exchange for one player. The one player uh, going to the Oakland A's is Daryl Hernandez. The other two coming back to the Orioles, lefty Cole Irvin, righty Kyle Verbitsky. Let's talk about Cole Irvin first and foremost because he is the main part, part of this deal coming back to the Orioles. He's entering his age 29 season. He is a lefty. He is a starter. Last year with the Oakland A's, he went 9-13 and 13 with a 3-9-8 ERA in 181 innings pitched, struck out 6.4 per 9 innings with a 1.160 whip. This is a guy who was thrice drafted. He was drafted in the 29th round, then the 32nd round, and then finally in the 5th round by the Phillies several years ago. He wasn't terrific with the Phillies, was eventually moved over to the Oakland A's, had a so-so 2021 season, and last year had the best season of his career with an ERA, as mentioned, a tick below four. He's not a big strikeout guy. He did lead the league in hits allowed in 2021, but he is an innings eater, and he is a veteran presence for this rotation that certainly needed both of those things. Yeah, you mentioned the 398 ERA. That 398 ERA would have been second best among Orioles starters, among pitchers who started at least 20 games, so that's counting out Austin Voth in that scenario. And those 181 innings were two more than Jordan Lyles, who was well-known for eating innings. For he was starving for him. He was. He was. Cole Irvin, he's not going to really blow you away with his stuff. As you mentioned, the strikeout numbers are not really there. His fastball sits around 90 to 91. It's nothing overwhelming. But Cole Irvin's game is pretty much induce soft contact if possible. Over the last few seasons, he has induced contact. It just hasn't been the softest contact in the world. So I think the Orioles are hoping that 
there is room for growth there. And the spin rates for Irvin are also not really great. I think that's something that the Orioles could be looking at as a potential area for growth as well. He was in just the fourth percentile for, I believe, his fastball spin, sixth percentile for his curveball spin. That's not great. So I think the Orioles feel like they can probably unlock something in Irvin that can take him from a 398 ERA pitcher to something better than that because it seems like the stuff is there. It's At least it's there to the point where he is not giving up a lot of runs. He has a great walk percentage. He has a really good command of the strike zone. He's inducing the contact that he wants to induce and not allowing a ton of runs in the process. But I think if the Orioles are able to help get that spin rate up and help with a couple of the other more advanced metrics in Irvin's game that don't really jump off the page, if you can see some improvements in those areas, I think Irvin can be a much improved pitcher in Baltimore. Yeah, you mentioned the K rate, which is in the 89th percentile, according to StatCast. That's phenomenal. The walk That's rate, 89th percentile. Walk rate, excuse yeah. me, not the K rate, because everything else on a StatCast <laughs> page is in blue. The walk rate is in red. That means it's great. Everything else pretty much is is below average. Average, average exit velo, hard hit percentage, expected batting average, expected slugging percentage, barrel percentage, K percentage. Cole Irvin is not coming to Baltimore to be an ace, but there is some hope that he could be a starting pitcher in this rotation for at least this season. And the good thing is about Cole Irvin is, he is under team control for quite a while. He isn't arbitration eligible until next offseason, and he won't become a free agent until 2027. You mentioned Austin Voth as somebody who came to Baltimore and was able to unlock some things. Cole Irvin has that potential, and he also was pretty good last year. So the reason that the Orioles had to give up a prospect like Daryl Hernandez in this deal was the fact that Irvin's counting numbers, despite the fact that his... Uh, stat cast numbers are all below average despite you know except for that walk percentage the 398 ERA is pretty solid like you said and the hope is that Irvin can be a good starting pitcher for them Brendan I know you talked a lot of the offseason about the Orioles needing to get an opening day starter because they signed Kyle Gibson to that one year 10 million dollar contract that filled a Jordan Lyles-like role of being an innings eater, a veteran presence in the clubhouse, a back end of the rotation starter. Does this satisfy your need of getting a legitimate starting pitcher who has the potential to be near the top of the Orioles' rotation? Kind of. <laughs> I know that's kind of a cop-out answer, but my answer is kind of. Cole Irvin doesn't really profile as a number one or a number two type of starter, but he also doesn't really profile as a number four, number five. I think in this Orioles rotation, ideally, if you had a solid number one, Cole Irvin would probably be sitting right around your number three. I think his ceiling, if the Orioles are able to unlock some things with him, as we have mentioned, is probably around a number two starter, but I don't think his floor, as a, a commenter, commenter on YouTube would add as well, Chris, saying ceiling number two starter, floor number four starter, which is pretty much how I feel about Cole Irvin. He's not quite that back end of the rotation starter, and I think I would have been a little bit disappointed if the Orioles made a trade for a back end of the rotation starter because they already had a lot of those guys. Cole Irvin, I think, profiles as a step above somebody like Tyler Wells. We'll talk about who he could potentially bump out of this Orioles starting rotation this year. I think he is a step above somebody like Tyler Wells. Maybe he's in the same tier as somebody like Kyle Gibson, but he is not quite to the tier that I think many were expecting and maybe hoping that the Orioles would go out and either sign in free agency or trade for this offseason. But it's still a pretty low-risk move when you're giving up probably your fifth-best shortstop prospect in the system for somebody who has a ceiling of a number two, number three starter. It's maybe not the ace that you were looking for, and maybe that ace comes internally. Maybe it's Grayson Rodriguez in a year. Maybe it's John Means when he comes back from Tommy John surgery. Cole Irvin, I think, could be your opening day starter. I'm not sure if he will be, but he certainly throws his name in that hat with guys like Kyle Gibson for that opening day spot. He's not really the ace that I was hoping for, but it is more than just kind of a back end of a rotation piece. He might be the opening day starter for the Orioles only because of their lack of options 
elsewhere. Now, John Means is a legitimate ace once he comes back, but as we know, he had Tommy John surgery. He's not going to come back until probably June or July at the earliest, so he's out of the conversation. Other than that, Tyler Wells probably isn't as good of an option on opening day as, you know, he, his numbers might lead you to believe. I just don't imagine the Orioles would throw him in that kind of situation. Maybe Kyle Bradish, but he had an ERA around five last year. Maybe Dean Kramer, but Dean Kramer's periphery numbers, if you talk about Kyle Irvin's periphery numbers not being very good, well, Dean Kramer's in the same conversation. And Dean Kramer was striking out fewer batters per nine than Cole Irvin was last year. And Cole Irvin's 6.4 strikeouts per nine was not terrifically impressive. So maybe Irvin gets the slight bump there. There are some concerns when it comes to Cole Irvin, aside from those stack cast numbers that we mentioned. One would be the ballpark factor, because he was pitching at the Coliseum in Oakland, which is incredibly pitcher-friendly. According to StatCast, they rank all the ballparks by ballpark factor and which ones are the most hitter-friendly, which ones are the most pitcher-friendly. The Coliseum was 28th, according to StatCast and ballpark factor, which means they were allowing the third fewest hits, runs, home runs. Camden Yards was ninth, even with that left field ball being moved back. And I know he's a lefty at Camden Yards, so facing a lot of righties who won't be able to hit the ball over that left field wall. But he also pitches better in his career against right-handed hitters than he does against lefties, which is reverse for his splits. So there are a little bit of areas of concern here when it comes to Cole Irvin and kind of strange his fit in Baltimore because he is a lefty, but he pitches better against righties. And because he's coming from Oakland where the pitching factors were even better than they were in Baltimore. So those are my main areas of concern when it comes to Cole Irvin. I just don't know if it'll they'll those areas of concern will be large enough to keep him from starting on opening day. And one more, the Orioles start, on opening day in Boston. They are going to be on the road for opening day. Cole Irvin last year, part of this could have been because he was pitching in the Coliseum, as mentioned, 307 ERA at home, 526 on the road. So will he get the opening day start? That won't be as important as will he be able to contribute to this rotation for over the course of the entire season, or at least until John Means comes back and the Orioles have a healthy and productive Grayson Rodriguez slash DL Hall insert pitching prospect here. Yeah, there are definitely some concerns with Cole Irvin, and that's just kind of what you're going to get when you don't move a top 10, 12 prospect in your farm system to get somebody in return. The 398 ERA, that's still a pretty good counting number. That's a pretty good ERA. Like I mentioned before, it would have been the second best in the Orioles starting rotation last year among guys that had at least 20 starts but you're giving up Daryl Hernandez, As I mentioned, your fifth best shortstop prospect. And so you're not getting an ace here in return. We saw just about, what, a week ago at this point, maybe it wasn't even that long ago, it just feels like a while ago, we saw the price for Pablo Lopez. Yeah. And that was uh, a hitter in a rise who is an all-star with a lot of team control and led the American League in batting average last year. Maybe led close to all of baseball in batting average last year. I think he did. He might have led all of baseball in batting average last year. That was the price for somebody like Pablo Lopez, a price that the Orioles were clearly not willing to pay. And while Cole Irvin is not Pablo Lopez, he is not a bona fide opening day starter, not a stud number two to join this rotation, he still got high upside. He's still younger. He's still got a lot of team control left. And he gives you probably more upside than somebody like Daryl Hernandez would have. It's hard to compare a starting pitcher already at the majors with a 20-year-old shortstop. But when you're looking at this deal, it's your fifth best shortstop prospect for somebody who can make a pretty much immediate impact at the big league level. And yes, those question marks are there. But I think value-wise, Paul, we got a question on YouTube that I think this would be a, a good time to answer is how would you grade this deal? Somebody else on YouTube, Cam giving it a B plus, I think I'd be right around there. And Cole Irvin is not a bona fide ace, but he has a ton of years of team control. He doesn't become a free agent until 2027. And you didn't give up all that much to get him. So I think B plus is right around where I would fall for Irvin. 
I probably would too. And I'm glad you brought up the Pablo Lopez comparison. That was a trade that we thought the Orioles might make because we certainly had heard that he was on the block. We knew that the Marlins had just signed Johnny Cueto. We knew that they had a bevy of young starting pitchers, and Pablo Lopez was the closest to free agency out of those guys. We figured he was going to be on the block, and we thought the Orioles might match up well with the Marlins in terms of trade value because they were so loaded in shortstops and shortstop prospects, and the Marlins had just traded their starting shortstop. So we thought the Orioles might make that move. They didn't, and what the return for Pablo Lopez ended up being was roughly about a Cedric Mullins. I mean, Luis Arise in his career has 10.4 war. He's entering his age 26 season, and he had a 4.4 war according to baseball reference last year. The Orioles would have had to give up a player like a Cedric Mullins in that instance. I don't know if a, if a package of prospects would have been enough to get Pablo Lopez from the Marlins. Cedric Mullins last year had 3.8 war. He had has, over the course of his career, a 9.2 war, and he's entering his age 29 season, I believe, age 28 season. So the Orioles would have had to give up a whole lot more to get Pablo Lopez. And yes, you're getting a, a better pitcher, but were you really willing to give up a starting major leaguer? I don't know if Jorge Mateo and a couple extra prospects would have been enough. I know Mateo is a starting major leaguer, but let's be honest, his offensive upside does not provide a whole lot of value to the team that would be acquiring him. So I would, I tend to think that Pablo Lopez would have cost more than Jorge Mateo, given what he went for. Would you agree, Brendan? Yeah, I would agree. And also, I would not really be willing to give up Cedric Mullins yeah. for Pablo Lopez. I, and I think it probably would have taken Cedric Mullins and prospects in order to get Pablo Lopez in return. And you're right. Pablo Lopez is a better pitcher than Cole Irvin. It was a name that we tossed out as a big possibility for the Orioles this offseason. But in Irvin, you were getting a pitcher who, yes, has probably some a lower upside than Pablo Lopez is giving you at this point in his career. But you didn't give up a key piece at your major yeah. league level. It was clear the Marlins wanted a piece that would help them in their lineup right away. So... The Orioles would have had to give up somebody like Cedric Mullins. Sure, if it was Mateo and some prospects, nothing against Jorge Mateo, but the Orioles have enough shortstop depth where giving up Jorge Mateo and a couple of prospects wouldn't have killed you down the line. Giving up Cedric Mullins, I know you have outfield depth. I know Colton Kowser is close to the big leagues, but if you were to trade Mullins for Pablo Lopez, there's a lot of mixed feelings there for me. Yeah, and to be clear, we haven't heard anything like that was the offer or that was what no, this the is Marlins just our speculation. Asking. It's just our speculation adding up the war, adding up what these players are valued at roughly. I'm glad you mentioned the shortstop depth that the Orioles have because let's talk briefly about Daryl Hernandez and what the Orioles are giving up in this deal. Hernandez is entering his age 21 season. We just had Orioles director of player development, Matt Blood, on the podcast. If you haven't heard that podcast, please go back and do so. He put Hernandez and Freddie Ben Cosme in a similar category of top 30 prospects in the Orioles system who might be undervalued or underrated yep. simply because there are so many elite shortstop prospects ahead of them. And we're going to get the MLB Pipeline Top 100 tonight. And by the time you're listening to this, you might already know who's in the top 100. We don't at this point. Gunnar Henderson's going to be there. He's going to be in the top five, probably the top three. Probably the top one. Probably the top one. He's number two right now. We're going to get perhaps Joey Ortiz in the top 100. We could, you know, get Kobe Mayo, who's a third baseman in the top 100. Jordan Westberg. Jordan Jackson Westberg. Holiday, two short stops. If... It's Jackson Holiday, Joey Ortiz, Gunnar Henderson, and Jordan Westberg. That is four shortstops in the Orioles system in the top 100 prospects in baseball. With Jorge Mateo already being a bona fide starter at yes. shortstop at this point. And again, that, that position may be up for grabs once the likes of Westberg uh, is ready to and Ortiz are ready to go. However... Mateo has proven to be an above-average shortstop, especially defensively. So the Orioles are absolutely loaded at shortstop. So they had to give up a good player to do this. But the thing is, they are loaded at that position internally where you can suffer a kind of loss like this and still be okay. 
Hernandez last year hit 273 with a 779 OPS in 105 games between low single A Del Marva, high A Aberdeen, and double A Bowie. He made it all the way up to double A Bowie, was promoted twice over the course of the 2022 season. And I think it, once we get the Orioles top 30, I was expecting him to be bumped up a couple spots. I mean, there are so many great prospects in this system that it would have been hard to rise in the ranks. But what didn't he do last year to get himself a promotion in the Orioles top 30? I think we could have seen him maybe as the 13th, maybe topped out as the 12th best prospect in the Orioles system. And then over the course of the season, once guys graduated, once, you know, uh, once Gunnar Henderson was going to graduate from the prospect rankings, once maybe Jordan Westberg or Joey Ortiz or Colton Kowser was to lose their prospect rankings, I think this is a guy in her nays that was on the path to be one of the Orioles' top 10 prospects. He's a good player. He's a good player. He's an exciting prospect. He's ahead of his uh, where he should be for his age. But you have to give up something to get something, and her nays had to be the price here. Yeah, and her nays is a really good player. And there's no getting around the fact, as you mentioned, that in order to get somebody like Cole Irvin, you had to give up a really good prospect. It is entirely possible that if Daryl Hernandez were not in the Orioles system, he's probably a top 10 prospect in somebody else's system. I wouldn't be surprised if he goes to Oakland and is immediately slotted into their top 10 prospects in their system, maybe even higher than that. Like you mentioned, he got all the way up to double A Bowie in his age 20 season which is really impressive. He's a former high school draft pick, kind of gets overlooked, as you mentioned, because the Orioles have so many good shortstops in their system right now. And Paul, you and I have talked about this a lot. Just because you have a lot of a good thing doesn't mean you have to trade from it. The Orioles had a lot of shortstops. They didn't have to move any of them. There's uh, injuries are always going to happen. Maybe guys change positions. You never know what is going to happen with these prospects down the line. That's why they're prospects. So the Orioles didn't need to trade any of their shortstop prospects. But if you are looking to acquire somebody, it is really helpful to have such a surplus at one position that you can trade from. It's not like it's burning a hole in your pocket and, oh my gosh, you need to trade Daryl Hernandez as soon as possible because you don't have room to play him. That's not the case. The Orioles just had a lot of shortstops, which makes it a little bit of an easier pill to swallow to be able to trade from that group. It's not like you were just itching to move somebody. You shouldn't trade from a surplus just because it's there. And the other player involved in this deal, and this guy actually comes to Baltimore, so that goes to show just how good of a prospect Errol Hernandez is, that it was Hernandez to Oakland and Cole Irvin and another player to Baltimore, and that's Kyle Verbitsky, 24 years old, a 4.63 ERA last year between single A and double A for Oakland. Very high strikeout numbers, 10 strikeouts per nine, but that ERA is not phenomenal for a guy who finished the season at double A and is 24 years old. He's not a member of the Oakland A's top 30. I don't think he factors into the Orioles' plans over the next couple years, but I think he is added minor league depth Somebody that, uh, you know, I think of in the vein of, you know, a, a guy that they get as a throw-in, uh, as like an Easton Lucas that was in the Jonathan sure. v VR deal. A guy like that uh, who is just kind of a throw-in in, in this deal. And maybe, you know, he provides you something in the minor leagues and they see something in them that they can lock into, but he doesn't really, you know, move the scales a whole lot in a deal like this. Not a whole lot. And I'm not going to sit here and say that Verbitsky is an incredible piece. As you mentioned, he's not in the A's top 30 prospects. A few things stuck out to me about him that were interesting to me, Paul. First off, he's 6'7". That's a really tall pitcher. and That's like was, Tyler Wells size. Yeah, uh, that's a large dude. And I was looking at some of the reasons as to why he had that 431 ERA last year. The strikeout numbers were pretty good. That's not the reason. He struck out 10 batters per nine. He walked just about two guys per nine. So that's not really the reason he was giving up a lot of runs. He only allowed 1.3 homers per nine innings. That's not really the reason he was giving up a lot of runs. It was the hits. He allowed nearly 10 hits per nine innings last year. You would have to think, Paul, that the Orioles must see some potential upside there for somebody who strikes out a good amount of guys, doesn't walk a lot of guys, doesn't really give up home runs, 
he was just allowing a lot of hits. And again, I don't know a lot about Verbitsky. I'm not all this familiar with the Oakland A's system. But for somebody whose strikeout, walk, and home run numbers are pretty good, who stands at 6'7 and hasn't had that much time in professional baseball, seems like there's room for growth there if the hits per nine are the biggest issue with Verbitsky. Think about it this way, Brendan. He would immediately be your starting center on your intramural basketball team. Absolutely. And, he and that probably, is what is important. Without having, him seen, without having seen him dribble a basketball, I can confidently say he would probably average 20 and 10 for your team. I, I would confidently say so. Yeah. I would confidently say so. So, Paul, the biggest question that we have been getting, which I think is the biggest question that I have after this trade as well, is not even will Cole Irvin be your opening day starter, but who is now bumped out of the Orioles' starting rotation? Because yeah. I have said all along over the previous few podcasts, however many weeks it has been, that if the Orioles are going to acquire a starting pitcher, it should be somebody with higher end of the rotation upside because you don't want to bump somebody out at the back end of your rotation if they're all just kind of jumbled in the same group here. I think Cole Irvin is a step above a few of the back end of the rotation guys that the Orioles currently have, like Kyle Gibson, Tyler Wells. He's probably, for me in terms of talent, in the tier of a Kyle Bradish or a Dean Kramer, maybe not with the same upside, but he's probably in that tier. And Paul, when I look at the Orioles starting rotation, you have Kyle Gibson and Cole Irvin feel like pretty much locks. You have spent the most this offseason to acquire them, whether that be giving Kyle Gibson the $10 million deal, which is the largest deal on the Orioles at this point, and trading a good prospect for Cole Irvin. You have invested the most in those two starters, and I think those two guys are pretty solidly in the rotation. And then you have the two that I would consider pretty much locks in Kyle Bradish and Dean Kramer. They just looked too good last year, especially at the back half of 2022, to bump out of the rotation for me this year. I think those two guys are pretty much locks. And then the other guy who is also pretty much a lock to me, because I don't see how he's not in the starting rotation if he's fully healthy, is Grayson Rodriguez. I think if he comes to spring training completely healthy, looks good to go. We saw him very briefly at the end of last year. I think Grayson Rodriguez should be in this starting rotation, and that's five. And that leaves Tyler Wells, Austin Voth, Spencer Watkins, D.L. Hall as all out of this starting rotation. And Paul, with at least in the case of Tyler Wells, I would imagine that he is the first man out of the rotation at this point but you worked so hard to get him into the starting rotation last year. It's, I, I don't know, it, it would be a little bit surprising for me to not have Tyler Wells start any games this year, to only have that starting pitching experiment be for one season, especially when he looked pretty good prior to injury. Well, two things on that. One, I think health is the biggest thing here because how often do we say going into spring training, the Orioles are too loaded at this position, they have too many candidates for this job. How are all these guys going to make the roster? And then somebody goes down with injury over the course of spring training. It's six weeks in Sarasota to ramp these guys up. Over those six weeks, you hope no injuries occur, but odds are one will. And one of these guys will hit the injured list, maybe not on opening day, but maybe early in the season. And you hope everybody stays healthy and that competition remains there. But the Orioles are now built a little bit better to suffer, to handle one of the injuries to one of their starters. So I do think injuries could affect any one of the six guys that you mentioned, and that might open the door and make it a little bit easier to fit five starters into there. I think Cole Irvin, the fact that he is a lefty in a sea of righties, I mean, the five guys that you had lined up before the Orioles acquired Cole Irvin were righties. So yep. that makes Cole Irvin a little bit more valuable and even more of a lock in addition to the fact that you just gave up a top 20 prospect in your system to acquire him, he's pretty much a lock for this rotation because he's a lefty. And the Orioles aren't going to have any lefties in this rotation until John Means comes back or if D.L. Hall pulls a shocker and somehow makes this rotation out of camp. I don't think that Tyler Wells is all that untouchable in the rotation. I know that the Orioles put a lot of effort and time into making him a starter last year. 
but he has unfortunately been injury prone since the Orioles acquired him, even before they acquired him in the Rule 5 draft. That's part of the reason they were able to get him in the Rule 5 draft is because he had suffered Tommy John surgery and had to miss a lot of time an entire season uh, in the minor leagues. Then he comes to the Orioles. He misses a lot of time in 2021. He missed a fair amount of time in 2022. And he flashed potential at times in the rotation last year, but he wasn't dominant. He wasn't lights out. And we talked about how low his how low Cole Irvin and Dean Kramer's strikeout numbers were. Well, guess what? 6.6 Ks per nine from Tyler Wells. I know he's got strikeout stuff. That's not jumping off the page to me. And no. neither is his 423 ERA. And when he missed a good portion of the season, about a month plus of the season, made 23 starts last year, that leads me to believe that Tyler Wells would be the first guy out. But spring training is six weeks long. That's a lot of time to evaluate these guys, to get hands-on experience with these guys, and to see them in game action after a five, six-month offseason. These guys could look drastically different in Sarasota than they did in September and October last year. So one of these guys could fall off. One of these guys could make it a surprising, incredible leap. And we're talking about this conversation very differently. And as I said, one of these guys could get hurt. So I think this is a problem that will sort itself out. If I were to put down in pencil my five starters right now, I would have Tyler Wells in the bullpen, and I would have Cole Irvin in his place in the rotation. I don't know how I would line them up in terms of order, but those would be my five. Kyle Bradish, absolutely. Kyle Gibson, yes. Dean Kramer, yes. Grayson Rodriguez, like you said, Brendan, there's no reason if he's fully healthy that he shouldn't make this rotation out of camp. And Cole Irvin gets my final fifth and final spot. If you're going with a five-man rotation, you decide to not go with a six-man rotation. Yeah, I think a six-man rotation is a possibility. I would be sure. surprised if the Orioles went that route, but it is still a possibility. Paul, I'll throw out this hypothetical for you. Tyler Wells is coming back from injury. You want to ramp him up a little bit. Grayson Rodriguez is coming back from injury. You want to ramp him up a little bit. The Orioles could run a five-man rotation with Grayson Rodriguez as their fifth starter. And as Grayson Rodriguez is still recovering from injury, working his inning total back up, maybe you cap Grayson Rodriguez at five, six innings. Maybe you have a pitch limit for him over the first few weeks, few months of the season, whatever it might be. And Tyler Wells, who was a starter last year, is now more comfortable pitching two, three, four innings at a time is also given a pitch limit and is able to piggyback off of Grayson Rodriguez as your fifth starter in that rotation. Yeah, piggyback. Remember yeah. that term? Oh, it yeah. Was all we were talking about about uh, 10 months ago because the Orioles, after that shortened 2020 season, decided to, out of camp, go with this piggyback rotation where they would give guys three, four innings and then have another starting pitcher come in in his stead and pick up another three, four, four innings. I think that's on the table here. I think the Orioles could go with the exact same thing in this instance, and I think it's going to be up to Brandon Hyde and Chris Holt to divvy out the innings. I don't think with the when the Orioles made this acquisition that they're 100% sure on who their starting five are going to be in the rotation. I don't think they have a firm set-in-stone plan for these guys. I think you, you go to camp and you see what you have. And like I said, maybe D.L. Hall lights the world on fire in yeah. Sarasota, and you want to stick him in the rotation or you want to make him a piggyback starter to come in in somebody's stead. He's a lefty who could replace a righty in the middle of a game. So I think that the options here are not limitless, but there are a whole lot more options once you acquire a bona fide lefty starter in Cole Irvin than there were before you made this move. And consider the fact that uh, you know Tyler Wells has suffered injuries. You mentioned Grayson Rodriguez missing a lot of time last year in the minor leagues with that lat strain. Grayson Rodriguez is a rookie. D.L. Hall, who could be in the starting bullpen, is a rookie. So you are going to have bumps along the road. Not all these guys are going to be aces and, and hit the ground running once they come to the big leagues. So you could experience bumps along the road with your rookies, and you could need to use somebody like a, you know, a Tyler Wells, like um, an Austin Voth out of the bullpen to eat three, four innings at a time. Yeah, and we're getting a lot of questions as well about what maybe the middle of the season looks like when you have 
John Means returning from injury when maybe D.L. Hall has looked good in the bullpen and maybe you still want to give him some starting spots. I think, again, Paul, as you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, things always seem to work themselves out. We always seem to have these kinds of discussions, and then there are injuries. There are guys not performing as we expected them to. There are guys overperforming what we expected them to do coming into the year. I think things are going to work themselves out by the middle of the year. John Means and D.L. Hall will probably find their way. Well, John Means will definitely find his way to starts by the middle of the season. D.L. Hall might find his way to starts by the middle of the season. I think things are just going to probably work out a little bit better than you usually think when you go into spring training and there is a crowd. And another question on YouTube as well, uh, more of a discussion, but I'm going to make it a question. The Orioles starting rotation, is it better than it was last year? I would say at least going into the season, it is definitely better than it was last year. When you are looking at what the Orioles added Last season, you had Jordan Lyles as your offseason addition, and then you had Tyler Wells going from the bullpen to the starting rotation as almost a pseudo addition there. And then in the middle of the season, you had somebody like Austin Voth come in and pitch well. Kyle Bradish wasn't in this opening day five to start the year. He wasn't in the opening day rotation. I think this rotation heading into 2023 is significantly better than the opening day five than you had last year. I think so, and I think on paper, paper often ends up being very different from reality. Paper beats rock. rock. Sure does. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I think that adding Grayson Rodriguez is on paper an upgrade, but we'll see. It's going to be his first ever starts in the big league. You have no idea how good he's going to be out of the gate. Look at the team that they had last year and some of the guys that they gave several starts to. Bruce Zimmerman who had a 6 ERA last year, made 13 starts for this team. I know he was great for his first four starts. The, you know, nine starts after that were not as good. Um, Austin Voth won't have to make as many starts, and he could be even better next year for the Orioles if you use him more sparingly. It's hard to imagine considering he had a 3.04 ERA, but maybe he turns into a lights-out, you know, innings eater or out of the bullpen, uh, a piggyback starter. Uh, You know, Spencer Watkins had to make 20 starts last year. If everything goes right for the Orioles, Spencer Watkins shouldn't have to make any more than 10 starts, five starts, two starts for the Orioles this year. One start. One start. He may not have to start at all for the Orioles this year. He's on their 40-man roster, so he may. Yeah. But the Orioles are much better prepared on paper to suffer injuries, to suffer bouts of guys having bad starts, having bad play. They're much better prepared to handle the AL East this year and their starting five or six or whatever you want to count them are much better equipped to go into this season than they were at this point last year. But you never know. Paper is a lot different from reality. And last year, the Orioles bullpen looked like a disaster a year ago and they ended up being one of the best in baseball. I think they're, they have an even better bullpen on paper this year than they did last year, but who knows? They could have, they could, have a lot of guys have down years and that bullpen turns out to be one of the worst in baseball. Yeah. And we've been talking about six, seven, eight guys that have the potential to start games this year. It's not really a problem because there are always going to be injuries. There are always going to be guys who don't perform exactly as you were hoping. It is really valuable to have that starting pitching depth. Yeah. And Paul, final question for you before we get out of here is Mike Elias done. Are the Orioles done acquiring starting pitching this offseason? I would say probably. Unless it is a high-end starter, you have kind of filled the need for a number three, number four type of guy in Cole Irvin. Maybe he's even your opening day starter, but ideally he's a number three, number four starter. Do you think Michael Elias is done this offseason acquiring starting pitchers? I don't know, and I don't think Mike Elias knows. That's probably true. I think he feels a lot better about his rotation, a lot better about his pitching staff right now than he did three hours ago before they made this trade. Yeah. But I don't think he's satisfied, and I don't think he's ready to go into Sarasota with the team he has. I don't think he is kicking back in his chair and saying, we got our 40 men that we're going to go into Sarasota with, and we, we have our 26 that we know we're going to break camp with. You have to be flexible. And like Rockabaco wrote on MassInSports.com this morning, 
Mike Elias isn't ready to call it quits on improving this roster, and he shouldn't be. How many times have we seen over the years Mike Elias make trades, make additions right before spring training? I'm pretty sure he brought in Felix Hernandez on the first or second day of February. Yeah. He uh, he traded Tanner Scott and Cole Sulser during spring training last year to the Marlins. He added Michael Franco on a minor league deal during spring training, I'm pretty sure, or the major league minimum, whatever it, it was at that point, $840,000. Why is that number stuck in my head? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that's the exact dollar amount. Look it up. Yeah, you sound pretty confident about it. I'm not going to question I do, so it. therefore I, I couldn't be wrong. Uh, right. Michael Elias likes to make trades during spring training. He likes yeah. to make signings during spring training. I think that the Orioles are keeping themselves open to that possibility. I don't know if it's going to happen, but it often does when Mike Elias is at the helm. Yeah, that's my answer. It, possibly not done. I, I don't think this fills the exact need that we talked about going into this offseason. It's not the super high-end guy. Maybe if there is a trade option available for one of the high-end starting pitchers around the league, maybe Mike Elias is able to make a move there. I think he's going to keep the phones open. I think he's going to keep looking. I don't think this move means that he is satisfied, like you said. I, I don't think that this is just an end-all to the starting rotation. Cole Irvin is a good addition. I don't know if it's the last addition. Optionality is the key word here, and I yeah. think that uh, the fact that they have the number one farm system in all of baseball means that if the right guy becomes available, they can deal him. Yep. Giving up Daryl Harnais for another team... Might not be the end of the world, but it might be a bigger blow than it would be for the Orioles. So it's not like they made a massive move where they shipped out Jordan Westberg and Joey Ortiz and everybody that they have in their system to get uh, an ace starting pitcher. They have the flexibility to get pretty much whomever they want. Michael Elias said that during winter meetings, and they should. They have the number one farm system in baseball. Every team is coveting the Orioles' prospects. Will the right guy get, become available, and will he become available for the right price? I think all of that matters. Brendan, one more thing we have to discuss here. Sure. got to pour one out for Darwinson Hernandez. Ah, oh, we do have to discuss Darwinson Hernandez. He I almost forgot. The corresponding move. He was on the team for so long, and he was such a significant part of the Orioles' seasons that I, I can't believe I forgot about the DFA of Darwinson Hernandez. He might still be with the Orioles. This is true. Could stay in the organization. Come spring training. He could waivers. clear waivers yep. and be reinserted back into AAA Norfolk. But for right now, he is on waivers. And teams will try to claim him at this point. And he could be out of the organization shortly, could be traded, he could. could be claimed. But for right now, he is hovering in limbo. And Brendan, after the Orioles traded cash considerations to the Boston Red Sox to acquire the, the lefty, I thought that there was a chance that he could make this bullpen. And then we looked at the guys in the bullpen and we thought, we can probably come up with a group of eight that's better, that does not include Darwin's and Hernandez. So, Yeah, and it's interesting that this move happens after the Orioles trade for him. We said the same thing when the Orioles designated Ryan O'Hearn for assignment after they traded for him from Kansas City. The cash considerations trade does not necessarily mean that you are exempt from a DFA, as we have seen in the past. And so Darwin's and Hernandez, hopefully he stays within the organization. The Orioles obviously saw enough in him to acquire him in the first place, and the ERA was not very good, but the strikeout numbers were certainly there. He had the former top prospect pedigree, so maybe Darwinson Hernandez is able to stick in this organization. The Orioles are able to hold on to him and develop him at AAA Norfolk rather than at the big league level. Don't fall in love with somebody who is traded for in the offseason via cash considerations. Never do it. They break your heart every time. Claimed off waivers. I mean, tis better to have loved and lost than not to have loved at all. That's but, what everybody uh, says about Darwin's and Hernandez. Too many. Too I believe that actually that quote originated from somebody talking about Darwin's and Hernandez. I think it was actually Lucius Fox that, that somebody was that talking about. That could have been it. Yep. Uh, you just can't. Or Yolmer Sanchez. You just can't fall for these guys, Brendan. Maybe. Uh, one more thing I want to address. Like we keep saying this on YouTube comments asking for a revised win projection. Mm. I don't think we can make it a set-in-stone win projection until we get closer to spring training, until yeah. we get closer to opening day, frankly. But I'm going to stick with what I had before, which I think was 85 or 86. Yeah, I was somewhere in the 84 to 88 range. I like Cole Irvin. I like this trade. 
I don't think he changes my win total all that much. I'm going to stay right there. Yeah, in plus, the 84 probably to 88 range. Plus half, a, plus a quarter of a win. Yeah, I think Cole Irvin's a good addition. I don't think he takes the Orioles from an 85 win team to a 95 win team. Yeah, we shall see. We shall. It's maybe gonna, he will. Yeah, you never know. And maybe there is another another move to be made on the horizon. And you can hear more about the addition of Cole Irvin and the trade itself on the Orioles Hot Stove Show on Friday night at 9 p.m. Tune in to Masson uh, as myself and Rockabaco will break down this trade. We'll talk Orioles Caravan. So much exciting stuff. We'll talk to Steve Molesky about the MLB Pipeline's new Top 100. Uh, he will have you covered as well on MassonSports.com as we find out who, which of the Orioles prospects has made the Top 100. Of course, follow us on Twitter. At Brendan Morty is his Twitter handle. I am That's at Paul Mancano. Brendan, thanks so much for producing this podcast. I you got did. so close to having it be be pretty good, and then I accidentally switched to myself. It was almost perfect. Two minutes left. And yeah. I could see the, the terror in your eyes, too. It was like a raccoon yeah. facing the headlights. That's and to, not the phrase. to Gooseman on YouTube who says, <laughs> Hi, I made the stream about 30 seconds ago. I'm so sorry. This is, this is kind of the end of it. But you can go back and watch it from the very start. <laughs> right stuff. Uh, of course, the Mass and All Access podcast you can watch live every Wednesday on Facebook and on YouTube or watch it after the fact on MassiveSports.com and the Masson app and listen to it on any of your favorite podcast platforms like Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, all that good stuff. And of course, the podcast is brought to you by Toyota for legendary safety and reliability. Choose Toyota and let's go places. For Brendan Mortensen, I'm Paul Mancano. We'll catch you next time.